Hello, John. John, how are you doing? Happy New Year. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy yes. New Year. It's been a while. Yes, it has been. Huh? Always in spirit, right? Always. No, we had a rather uh, hectic holiday season. We had uh, my my daughter and son-in-law and, and grandson were up from the south of Germany, and his parents were here for three weeks as well. So we had a house full of people. I had to do a lot of cooking, and I'm glad everyone's going. So you do the cooking? Uh, for, the big- for the most part, I do, yeah. My grand, I had a grandfather on my mother's father. He yeah. did all the cooking. So yeah. whenever I visited, he was always in the kitchen. Yeah, that's where I spend most of my time. It's very therapeutic, I find. You know, I, uh, <laughs> My grandma with the, was in the back room with a cigarette, smoking, and she was reading, um, you know, these like cheap romances. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she had a little bottle of schnapps somewhere that she would hide. Oh, yeah. I, I had a grandmother who did... Uh, <laughs> Who read a lot of that uh, uh, cheap romance stuff? But um, she used to drink shots and beers. But she did, <laughs> but she did a lot of the cooking too. So <laughs> because she was a cook by trade. So my my grandmother knew how to cook, but you know my grandfather liked doing it. She left him alone, let him do it. So and he was a good cook. He took great pride in it. So yeah, I just I'm just happy when things get on the table and it's not burnt. <laughs> so. Well, I learned how to cook, too. I mean, my mother put me to work very early. So I wasn't, you know, because she had to work and, you know, I had to feed the kids and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I was one of five children. So um, if you didn't, if you didn't take care of yourself, you weren't going to get taken care of all the time because there was just like too much going on. So you learn to cook. You (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, everybody else is always congregating around. All of my brothers uh, can cook, though. I have to admit, we all we all kind of learned how to do that. It's a matter of survival in the end. Yeah, mm-hmm. I enjoy it. It's very yeah. comfort, relaxing for me. I, I find it so. You know, I can block things out. Ah, oh, Marco's here. Greetings. Happy New Year. Happy yes. New Year. Greetings. Hello, Doug. Survived the solstice. Hello, Marco. Uh, so, how are we all? Oh, well, not the worst for wear. <laughs> I'm starting to feel a little bit more like myself today. Yeah, I know. The uh, the trip kind of broke my whole pattern, and it, it, intentionally I meant it to do that, but <laughs> it wasn't the relaxing, you know, vacation of escape into the void that <laughs> said I had hoped for. <laughs> yeah, don't we wish we could have those? Yeah. You know? I spent two weeks in California in September, and it took me about two months to recover. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably uh, not going to do that one again, I think. <laughs> yeah, it sounded rather extended from what you were, you were saying. It's yeah. quite a journey across the States. Well, I'm coming to terms with the fact that not all my ideas are good. <laughs> and I have to be sometimes more discerning. Uh, when I'm inspired to do something, even though in in retrospect it it played out in the way I think mm-hmm. it was, things always do in retrospect. Yeah, I enjoy, I really enjoyed your visit. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank I, you. That was a lot of fun meeting your daughters. They're so they're adorable, mm-hmm. and, and your wife as well. She's adorable too. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were there were definitely high points. There were really good things about the about the visit and probably justify them all. So seeing you was one of them. Uh, visiting the uh, Cosm Chapel of Sacred Mirrors was another. Uh, I met another friend of mine as well, Brian. And and staying with, the, I went to really see my family and mm. and we went to see my, my wife's family as well. And so that was the point of it. That was the, you know, uh, what had to be done now rather than later, uh, because one never knows whether later will actually mm. arrive. And so um, that was that was good. I did spend the last week of this vacation in literally in the basement of my wife's family's house um, because it was below zero outside in Minnesota where they live. Uh, and so I just camped out in bed under the covers, catching up on the forum and listening to music. And that was act- that was the closest I got to the exit to the void uh, on mm-hmm. multiple dimensions of void 
uh, this whole trip. And so that kind of, I, I'm, it's good to come out of that. It's good to be back in yeah. Colorado. Um, but, uh, I thought it was kind of almost an absurd way to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to be that I, I, I secretly appreciate it actually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, their family is very courteous and, you know, allowing me to do that. And the girls, you know, had a ton of Legos to play with. So they were just, it was like Legos everywhere. Legos, dolls, <laughs> they were in uh, you know, La La Land uh, yeah, pretty much the good. entire time. So, yeah, that was good, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and now we're here uh, to have a Cosmos Cafe, our first of 2018. Yes. Yeah. And apropos, we're beginning with the book of Genesis and the Hebrew alphabet. Yes, that's the, that's the plan. Um, like I can tell you that the, uh, I've, I've thought about this and rethought about this it's a gazillion times because um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know where, where everyone's coming from. That's the one thing that's always a problem when you, when you try to do something with a, with a group of people. Um, we've talked, I, I kind of know a lot of things about, about all of you, but I really don't know a lot of details. And sometimes the details are the things that, that will stumble you up. So um, as we're going through this, if I, if I start saying things or talking about things that don't make a lot of sense, just stop me and go, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, that's, which is the, the simplest thing to do. And I'll, I'll try to do that because we, we are... I think if we if we go through this, going to talk about some things that may be familiar in, in certain regards and very unfamiliar in other regards. And the more unfamiliar things become, um, I don't know if you guys are like me, but then it takes me a whole long time to get it into my head that I can even digest or understand what somebody just said to me. Sometimes that uh, um, that's the approach. And, and it could be that, that a couple of things come up that just seem really odd. And then you go, wow, 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 wait a minute, you know, and, and we can, we can stop and we can talk about those things. But the, the, the whole idea behind this is because we were talking about space and time in a whole lot of different, different contexts. And that was the, all the links that I was able to put into the, to the page for this. Um, we don't have a common understanding of it and we're all still trying to figure it out. Obviously I am just as, as much as anyone else, but um, my my life's path has been very different from a lot of people's. And so I've ended up places where I never suspected I would end up. Um, I never suspected that I would live in California, but I did for 14 years. And it's one of the few places I can actually, well, I could live in the United States. After my trip back, I realized, well, I wouldn't be able to live there anymore either because things have changed so much. But I was there at one of those very opportune times where things kind of happen and you get exposed to a lot of things that you probably wouldn't have otherwise. And so I ran into people. I've met people. I've met ideas. I was able to pursue things that, that had a, a very huge impact on who I am and what I think and why I think the way I do. And, and I, I know very well that it's, it's very, very different from most of the people I know. Uh, my, uh, the primary reaction, I think John can relate to this for very different reasons, but it's the same kind of thing. That's just a little too weird for me. You know? <laughs> and they go, I'll take a step back from that, you know? And they go, okay. And it, and, but it seemed perfectly normal. I, the one thing I did like about California is I never, ever, ever heard anybody ever say, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> never. <laughs> because it didn't matter what you said. There was always somebody that was going to try to make money out of it. <laughs> and there were, other things that people said where you go, oh, no, that's just too weird. And it's like, well, no, that's, it's really everyday normal. I mean, California was in that regard when I was there at any rate, a very different kind of place to be. And I very much appreciated that because I'm one of those people that I've, been, I've always been open to things. I'm always looking for something. I would really like to understand how it is that we got, you know, those Gapesarian questions. You're like, who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? I'd really like to know that. You know, my, my whole life is centered around trying to figure that out. I don't know if I've made a lot of progress in doing that, but, you know, you know I, I sometimes have the feeling I'm nudging my way down the path, kind of like, you know, the snail. and you know, I'm getting a little somewhere. We'll take it when it comes. So the, 
the heart of, of all of this is actually, if, if you ask, well, where did we come from? That's that whole cosmology thing and creation and science has their big bang and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and we in the, in the West, you know, we have our own mythologies. We like to talk about the Sumerians and, and the Babylonians and the Egyptians and all the, the neat stuff they do. But we, we get a little hesitant when we start talking about our own near traditions. And even saying, a, a, you know, a term like Judeo-Christian, just, you know, it raises hackles with some, it sends other people scampering off to wherever. And, and I think it's important that, that we, we kind of understand the context where all these things happen and, and, and what we have for our own mythology and what it means for us. Um, I was raised in a very fundamentalist household. Um, my, br- my mother knew how to thump a Bible as good as anybody else. I had to go to church very uh, much more regularly than I wanted to. Um, I was involved in all of that. Um, I developed a lot of my questioning attitude at the time. I was uh, often chastised by my Sunday school teachers, then later by my family and my father and in many different ways. <laughs> you guys, well, you just don't ask things like that. Well, well, why not? You know, you know wh- why can't I ask that? You know, well, because that's that's not how it is. So, I've always had that very questioning attitude. I, I didn't really fit in, in in a lot of places. And California made me feel at home because nobody just said, "Well, that's weird." You know, why would you think that? <laughs> no, can we make money out of that somehow? <laughs> so, there was there was a whole different attitude, which I very much appreciated. So. Um, I, I had, I'd ask everyone to at least take a look at Genesis because that's our primary creation story. It's where our Bible starts. And, and is, is there anything that, that struck any of you about that? Because I'm asking, well, you know, what, what have you been told and what do you believe and what do you think and how does that fit in now? And I'd kind of like to collect that a little bit just to get a background of where we're coming from before I, you know, jump into the, you know, to the meat of this. So, Well, I, I have my... My first Bible that I was given, this is a very, uh, 1960. Uh, okay. I have it. 1964. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was 10 years old. My, my parents got me this yeah. Bible. And uh, it has lots of good pictures. Yeah. And um, I was very drawn to the Gustave Dore, you know him? Mm-hmm. Illustrator of the Bible. Yeah. Very, very fantastic, phantasmagoric imagery. So um, they got me this Bible at my request. I also asked for the complete works of Shakespeare. <laughs> and they gave me that too. I don't know why. <laughs> they probably, but they just sort of let me go, go for what I was interested in. But I love the sound yeah. and, uh, of the King James Bible. And, I, and yeah. I read it from cover to cover. And I knew the stories really well. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but my, my parents basically dropped us off at Sunday school. Mm-hmm. Did our own thing there. And you know, and then they would sleep late, you know, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would wake us up. And, but I had this, uh, so I wasn't force fed anything, but it was mm. definitely a Southern Baptist orientation. And, um, but I, I love the Bible mm. and, uh, I read it and I, 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 I'm not pretending that I understood it very mm-hmm. well, but I got the gist of it, and the stories were very vivid and colorful. And the characters are yeah. very interesting, and they still and they stay with me, mm-hmm. even as I and it made uh, understandable vast mm-hmm. amounts of literature. Yeah. I don't have, if you know the Bible, you don't have a clue what it's all about. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to mention something about a friend of mine who lived in California. She was in the movie business, and she would um, and she was a very secular Jewish person. You know, she'd been, mm-hmm. uh, but she never. She didn't seem to know anything about the Bible. I was shocked. But she said, how come, you know, how come um, these fundamentalist types, these Baptist types, people like me, you know, mm-hmm. write such good, scary movies? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, really, they're really good at horror stories. I said, that's because we believe in hell. <laughs> we know there's a devil. We know there's a hell. And oh, yeah. I, I thought that was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, because later I was listening to a, a lecture by Camille Paglia, and she was talking about, the Bible and how, how, how our educational system is, is breaking down because they're, they don't, they're not enough people who know the Bible. Mm-hmm. 
so most of the literature just is over everyone's head. And she said, black people. She said, black people know the Bible very well. <clears throat> and, you know, Southern fundamentalists, too. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a tradition there that I, I, I find myself uh, very drawn to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think it creates a kind of oratorical kind of uh, sort of get into those rhythms. And that's why I posted uh, the Alexander Scorby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. His, reading, his particular reading of the Bible. Because that's to me, what, I, I remember like Alexander Scorby did all those yeah. special on Christmas time, the Hallmark mm-hmm. Hall of Fame and everything. He was always the distinguished voice. Yes, yeah. the, no, he has a very distinguished voice. That's a very nice, uh, very nice reading. Yeah. He does indeed, but I think of even better reading, and then I'll be, and then I'll pause. Is uh, Lawrence Olivier? He's mm-hmm. he does the Bible as well, but it's a terrible production. They yeah. have lots of sound effects, you know, yeah. the wind and the and the waves. <laughs> so all you need is this man's voice. He has the most yeah. exquisite voice. Yeah, he does. The interesting thing about Scorby and Olivier is Scor- Scorby is a very masculine, powerful voice. He sounds like the voice of God. And Olivier has a beautiful voice, but it's very lyrical, and mm-hmm. I, I would say feminine. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's interesting how different voices, the text can come through a different voice and have a very different quality. So it's a definitely interesting contrast is listening to Olivier, except that the performance, the production value is just terrible. It was really sabotaged. But anyway, that's my experience. It's to me, okay. cool. it's very theatrical. Mm-hmm. My, my affection for the Bible is, is uh, I'm plugged into the the very theatric, the enormous theatricality of it. And I'm glad I'm going back and rereading it because <laughs> my childhood, I've left my childhood behind in many ways. Mm. I think yeah. I need to update my sort of, um, uh, those first stages of my development where I've so gravitated to the Bible. I think I've learned many, many other things that I could bring to a, a reading of it. So mm. thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looping around as to where I'd like to start with this, but uh, I guess going off of what you just said, John, I I, I have no memory. I, I, I've been reviewing the Slaughter Dyke Bubbles um, group discussions that you guys shared, and I think I'm going back right now to maybe the fourth or fifth one when it was talking about going back to the womb and stem slough broth and things like that. Um, and Ed made a comment that he, he doesn't remember before the age of 12 or something like that. You, you mm-hmm. don't remember mm-hmm. that. And that's, that's Christianity for me. That's my upbringing. Although I was going to church, I, I know I was there. I have some vague memories of the, the places I was at, which are maybe mm-hmm. two or three different churches that I attended during that time. Um, but the Genesis story uh, that still baffles me. Today, when I look at it, there's there's not much I can extract from my youth as to what it meant for me. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that that's where I'd like to start there, is I, I don't know where to start. <laughs> uh, well, you're also in the South, right, Doug? So you kind of share some of the cultural context that John maybe was talking about. Does that have, like, how does that inform your experience of coming back to this text now? <clears throat> I suppose I've always been, uh, Tillich has an autobiography, autobiography called On the Boundary, um, in which he sees himself as between philosophy and theology, kind of the German culture that he grew up in and coming to America after all the World War II, everything that happened, uh, along with other things. He sees himself on the boundary of culture and rigid, religious life. Um, my, my mother was an avid Christian, my father was, I might have mentioned before, he, he doesn't share. He's very internal. I, I might have had maybe a five-minute discussion about what um, his spiritual views are. But besides that, it's, it, it ends up becoming a sarcastic joke for him to where he's thwarting any effort to dig deeper inside of who he really is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I've always been kind of torn as to where I, I need to be or want to be. And um, recently, uh, like the South might have been infused in me in a certain sense, like occasionally I might have the, the Southern drawl come out. But um, besides that, I, I know I've just infused the religious Christian Baptist mentality 
but it, it, it really doesn't have any meaning for me, or it didn't have any meaning until um, maybe here recently. I guess it was about three or four years ago. I, I go camping with my friends uh, from uh, high school. Some of them were at the same college there in U University of Tennessee. And they're all very Christian. A uh, group of four or five, I've always been kind of, I, I went with that group because they were, they were the better crowd for me, I guess. Mm. Um, but we, we've been friends for such a long time. But they had a discussion on Revelation and it, it went on for five hours in the middle of the night where the other campers were saying, please, uh, we're trying to sleep here. Um, but I, I had nothing to contribute to that, and I didn't know how to articulate my point of view, um, which not necessarily the scientific Harris Metzinger type of point of view. That's not me, but that's where I was kind of researching at that time. Was, now, how do I throw this into Christian theology? So that's when I started I, um, maybe two years ago, researching um, theologians, Christian, this and that, contemporary thought. And I was thrown to Tillich, the idea of God as the ground of being. Um, and I read his systematic theology, which was very enlightening for me. And that, that opened me up to all things Christian um, and the ability to now I can go back and revisit the Bible, I believe. I, I can, I've never read it um, to an extent to extract knowledge from it. Uh, I've read stories, of course, during Sunday school, maybe, but um, I'm, I'm honestly afraid to go back to it. It doesn't mean, if I read it, it like this Genesis 1 through 3 does not mean too much. It, it's it's uh, cryptic. To say. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, Tillich really allowed me to see the symbolism along with, uh, I suppose, Jordan Peterson has been mentioned here. And his biblical series is very pertinent to our time right now. And just the psychology behind it really uh, influences me, really um, gets my kicker going. Yeah. Well, I could relate to the kind of upbringing part of it, uh, Doug, where... I went to church as well. My mother is Catholic uh, from El Salvador. And so uh, she had a particular expression of her Catholic faith. And a part of that involved just as what, what our family did, going, going to church on Sundays and doing Sunday school and like absor ab absorbing the stories, the characters, the uh, language, the, even the style, the art of it. The, the sonority, all that by os osmosis, though not really appreciating it, appreciating it at the time. And I think probably when I was 16 or 17, I got into Jesus for a little while. I, I, I felt I needed some guidance in my, in my, in my life. My soul was beginning to wander and, you know, detach itself from uh, consensus reality. And uh, I, need a, a savior and so i i i think i, I read the new testament at, at that time and then i got into uh, my, my mind's lost the need i think for that kind of figure and so i was off into the world of literature and dostoevsky and nietzsche and etc etc but to john's point earlier what you learn uh, as a literary student student of literature and philosophy is that you can't understand that much about, you know, 90% of what's been meaningful that's been written in the last 2000 years w without understanding the Bible. And so I feel like my knowledge, my actual knowledge of the Bible is pretty sketchy. Uh, it's all kind of there, but it's jumbled up because I haven't studied it systematically. I don't um, participate in uh, Catholicism anymore, unless I'm back home and go to church with my mom. Uh, but I would actually have to make an effort, a focused effort to kind of sort it all out and refresh my memory and come to some grips or to a updated perspective on what it means to me. Uh, coming back to the book of Genesis now and to the opening words, and I, you know, because I think about, and we've been thinking about space and time so much, Anything that is about the beginning is very interesting. Uh, it's 
it strikes me as such a bizarre text, actually. <laughs> and, like, you know, if, if you are not familiar, it's not just the water you swim in and you come to it from, from a literary perspective. I, the book I'm, I have is, uh, is the Bible. It's an edition that was made, oh, I don't know, not remember when. It's a beautiful book, 1950. And it's the Bible designed to be read as living literature. And so the stories are condensed. They're, they're kind of put into a format. It's the same King James Bible, uh, but it's put into more of a readable format as if one were reading in his literature. And that I found that form amenable uh, to me. I also really enjoyed the YouTube uh, reading and um, that kind of got me in the spirit of what we were going to talk about today. Uh, I, I, I know that there are other sort of hidden aspects to the text uh, on the more esoteric side, uh, the Kabbalistic and um, mystery type, you know, schools that, that approach the text numerologically, um, symbolically, and, and there are other ways to interact with it that are not just looking at it as a mental construct or as some kind of crazy dream. Um, and so I think that, that those, my understanding was that was part of what you've, you've been studying, uh, Ed. Um, however, the dream itself is also really interesting. I mean, part of what you also said leading into this is that everything is connected. So can we have a spacious enough um, uh, kind of discourse, uh, not just for five of us, but you know, insofar as what the culture that allows for those rich interconnections because there's so much historically, theologically, philosophically, mythologically, politically, um, and uh, math for mathematically uh, that are embedded in this text that, you know, if, if you just have one lens or another and you're constantly hostile to the other lenses, you may not see it very well. And I, I hope that part of what we're doing in these cafes is honing our lenses and our, our you know, our multiple lenses and our ability to move between and combine our lenses. Okay, good. Very excellent. This is, this is more or less what I, what I expected. Uh, Marco, you mentioned, I got a couple of, you mentioned one word in, in what you were saying that was uh, Kabbalah. Um, does that, does Kabbalah mean anything to any of you? Other, I know that Marco mentioned it, so he's obviously come across the word before. I'm, I will be using it more than once before we're done. Um, does it mean something to you, John? Uh, yes, I, I have um, I have some sketchy ideas about the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have done, you know, like intro, introductory level readings, mm -hmm. for commentators. Um, some are more sophisticated than others. I don't know if you know this guy, Elliot Wolfson. Have Wolfson, you, yeah. 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 He, I read this book and I loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's another one of those thinkers who draws a lot on the Kabbalah. He doesn't look at the Kabbalah much in this book. I know in other books he evidently is quite as focuses on. Yeah, he's 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 a Kabbalist. He's considered a Kabbalistic scholar, but uh, it in, it informs everything he does. Uh, right, uh, and that, so that I got so yeah. Okay. And Jeffrey Kripal also religious. Uh, yes, yeah. he draws on Wilson a lot, and I've read some of his commentaries drawing yeah. on the Kabbalah, but. Okay. It's not an it's not an organized. No, no. Just just like our knowledge of the Bible, for the most part, isn't well organized. There's a lot. This is my, this is the point. There's lots of things that come into that that probably right. less organized. And you, Doug, what about? Uh, Ted, I want to make a comment that uh, <laughs> you guys remind me of reading Rainbow. That every five minutes there's a new book that pops up. <laughs> wow. You say, you say, I recommend this book because I really like the story. <laughs> they'll give a summary of it but uh, yeah you guys are great for that and no I'm, I'm going to play the the fool card for this one i know very little <laughs> that's okay uh, yeah and that, that's the thing because i'm trying to gauge what i say and where and anytime anything seems obs too obscure just you know flag it and tell me now i i have i have a bunch of powerpoint slides not that i'm going to powerpoint you to death um, the reason I did it that way is because I want to upload it when I'm done so that anyone who looks at this afterwards and, and maybe wants to see what we're talking about would also have something as a kind of a documentation of what it is that we're going to go through. 
that, that's the reason. So um, I'll flip through a couple of things um, for that very reason and, and, and now provide just a little bit of background um, on, on what we're going to do. So we're going to try this screen sharing thing now. Okay. This should be exciting. Um, I'm going to call up uh, PowerPoint and go into my built GM presentation. This is all in German. You won't be able to read my thing. It doesn't know now. Just, so, just as a, sorry to interrupt, but I'll probably have to leave around 4.30, uh, which is an hour from now. So it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to you know. I'll try to get the, to the main point before then. Believe me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to do the first couple of things really quick. Can you all see this, the slide that's up there? Or do I have to hit share here? I think I don't hit see share. It. Okay, you don't see it yet? Wait a minute, share screen. Okay. Try this. Now I have to do my PowerPoint. Share screen, hit the button. Okay, I see you guys on the right of my screen. Can you see this on the... Yes, I see the, it. Okay, good. good. All right, that's just the title. So we're going to talk about space-time and Hebrew letters, all right? Context. We're going to go back to the origins. What we call the Bible, for most of us, is something different than what other people call the Bible. And when I'm talking about the Bible, and in this particular presentation, I'm talking about the Old Testament. It is the Bible for Judaism, for Christianity. It's the part that you didn't read, Marco. And for Islam, it's also a sacred text. The um, um, the Muslims recognize, because that's where the story of uh, Abraham and Hagar, Ishmael, uh, come from. So it is for them a sacred text as well. So this, this is what unifies that Old Testament, if you will, is what unifies the three Abrahamic uh, religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and uh, Islam. And it's made up of a bunch of different kinds of texts. The first part is called the Torah. That's the law, the first five books of the Bible. There are the prophets. We've all heard about those because they like to rail about social inequality and unjust injustice and how you're all going to end up in a bad place if you don't do the right thing. And then there's a lot of um, uh, poetry and wisdom literature, history books as well that are involved in that. And the interesting part is, is well, I'll get to that in a moment. But I, what I find the fun fact in regard to the Old Testament is, is Isaac Newton thought it was an alchemical handbook and would tell him how to turn lead into gold. And so he, <laughs> he wrote about a million words of biblical exegesis just to find out how to do that. And this is a part that we never get to hear about Sir Isaac because we're into his laws of motion. That was about one million of the words that he wrote. The other million words of the three million he did produce uh, were strictly alchemical texts in and of themselves. So we only have one third of Isaac Newton's stuff uh, going around, but we're happy with that. So in there, at the very beginning, we have this creation story, but there are two creation stories in the Bible. One of them is in Genesis. That's the one we know about the six days and rest, God rested on the seventh day where everything was made. The second creation story is the one that appears in Genesis 2. And this is where Adam is created, placed in the garden, Eve is made, and shortly thereafter, the so-called fall takes place. So I'm mentioning this because we're going to come back to this later. It was that second creation story that Sloterdijk picked up on in uh, Spheres, completely ignoring the first one. Um, I don't think the two can be read apart from one another, but that's just me. And the fun fact in relation to all of this is... Uh, Rabbi Isaac of Akko in 1280 or so calculated that the age of the universe was actually 15 million, 300, a billion, 340 million, 500,000 years. <laughs> so this whole thing about, well, it's 6,000 years old and we can, <laughs> what a lot of fundamentalists, especially Southern Baptist fundamentalists like to, uh, to express, this, this has been questioned for a long time because according to Kabbalistic teachings, for example, the earth was 42,000 divine years old before Adam was even created. So God made the universe and then other things happened thereafter. Uh, this temporal aspect doesn't come out in those first two stories because they just run into each other in the text themselves. But it's kind of interesting to note that people within this sphere have been thinking about this differently than we generally understand that they have been for quite some time. So 
I'm going to focus on the Torah because that's the, the primary text. This is the part that, um, according to Judaic tradition, was dictated to Moses on Mount Sinai. And it is a text that comprises the first five books of the Bible. It's a specific revelation that was given to Moses. It is 304,805 letters long that has been subdivided into what we now see as our five books. And there is, and this is kind of interesting, the Catholics have a different Bible than the Protestants, and the Old Testaments are what's different. So there are more books in the Catholic Old Testament than in the Protestant Old Testament, and there are more that are in the Jewish Old Testament. Um, so when we talk about the Christian Bible, that's a very nice term, and it kind of, kind of points towards something that kind of looks like whatever it is that we were all holding up at some point. Because what the actual text is, we don't know. The nice thing about the Masoretic text, that's the one that we call the Torah, it has been very, very well researched over the last couple of hundred years, if not a couple of thousand years, and so it's a pretty stable text that we're dealing with. And that's the one that we're going to focus on later. And this is the case in all religions and in all, actually, um, philosophical and theological realms. There's always an exoteric side that everybody gets exposed to, and there's some kind of an esoteric side that people that are, we'll say, brought into the fold or others think are worthy for whatever reason uh, running about. And that is the same here. So we do have our exoteric commentaries on the, uh, what is called the Torah. There are also esoteric commentaries. I'll be making references to those. There are three primary books involved. One is called the Sefer Yetzirah, which is the book of creation. The Sefer Habahir is the book of illumination. And the uh, Sefer HaZohar is the, the book of brilliance. And those are all commentaries on the Torah. They were all written at later dates, but especially the Yetzira and Sohar have been incorporated into a, a lot of traditional uh, Judaistic thinking. So now we're going to take a look at this creation story. We're actually going to get to that. Now we have the context. We're going to look at this. And these are the first three verses in Hebrew. Now, I'm not expecting any of you to read that. Hebrew is read from right to left. So the numbers are on the right-hand side of the screen. And that first string of letters up there, there's about um, uh, six of them. That is that translate is in the beginning. And then there's another string of letters that says created, and then there's a string Elohim, and then there's a, a word that doesn't have anything underneath it because it is simply a marker that says a direct object is coming. <laughs> so in the beginning, Elohim created boom, Hamashaim. It's a dual form, so there are it's a, a two. Tunis in its plurality, not just a regular plurality. And then this word et with a little line thing in front of it, that's the conjunction and, and the earth. Okay, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That's what we kind of know. King James says, God for Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the standard line that we know going in. The one that we talked about earlier in the discussion is verse two, and the earth was an unreality. And emptiness and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim was moving gently upon the face of the waters. That's the second verse. And then where things really get interesting, this is where Young gets into the picture, for example, um, and said, Elohim, be light, and was light. That's the really basic literal translation. What we get from this is, this is an extremely compact language. Biblical Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, doesn't have anything extra in it at all. It is so, it's like reading Gapeser in a foreign language. It's, it's really dense and then hard to follow on top of that. So I just wanted to expose you to that because we're going to be coming back to this first line at the top this in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth because that's where it all really gets started, but this is simply placing it in context. Okay? So, now, this will seem very, very strange to you because when the Torah was first written, there were no word divisions. 
there were no sentence divisions. To this day, the only divisions that you find in the Hebrew text of the Bible are verse divisions, and they can be three or four sentences long. So you have to know, and this is why I wrote it in Hebrew, you read the top line from right to left, well, you look at it from right to left, you don't read it. And you don't uh, actually read the bottom line, but it's written alliterated, B-R-A-S-Y-T-B, going from left to right. That's how the text was originally. So in order to understand what this text is saying to you, you have to know where to divide it. You have to know how to parse it. And figuring out how to parse it is not is really not an easy thing to do. So that's what it is that we want to look at. So this is that first string again, and I'm going to take this first string of, what is it, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine letters. And in our text that we saw two screens ago, that actually says, in the beginning, created. That's what we generally translate this to be. But the way Hebrew works is kind of interesting. So I'm going to bring this out. You can also break it down so that it's three words. You have the letter B. You have this, this string in the middle where there's kind of a space in the last three letters. That is one way to parse that first nine letters. Because generally speaking, the first seven letters there, the Rashid, is considered one word in the beginning. Hebrew has this odd, odd function that you can use the letter B as the preposition in. It could also mean with. It can mean at. It can mean by or among. That's what the letter B hanging on the front of a word could mean. The word that follow is, follows it, Rashid, can mean beginning, first, first fruits, head, wisdom, a couple of other things. And the next word we see, B-R-A, Ra, means he created, generally speaking. So for those of you who have ever learned a foreign language with a more modern language thing, you could read, in the beginning he created, um, with the head he created, among the first fruits he created. There's a lot of different ways to read those first nine letters that we have there. And then you say, well, if I look at this text, I have a... I have a set of letters here at the front, the first three, B-R-A, and that same let string of letters shows up later, B-R-A. And so I've shown you that here in this little, so I've parsed it differently. So now I have this three-letter string, a space, three letters, and another three-letter string that's just like the first one. So the question is, well, if that last three-letter string means he created, why doesn't the first letter string mean he created? And it could very well mean that, because that's what that word means. He created. So if this thing in the middle, these three letters, mean something, then we even have another way to read this. And as it turns out, that sheet in the middle can mean six. So now we have he created six. He created the heavens and the earth. Or he created a thorn. He created the heavens and the earth. And as it turns out, because of the way Hebrew is made, and there were no vowel points. You saw those little points above and below the letters. Those are the vowels in Hebrew, and they came in about 1000 AD. So up until that time, there was just a string of consonants. And if you didn't know how to literally vocalize the text, you didn't know how, you didn't know what you were reading, or you didn't know what you were saying, or other people wouldn't understand what you were saying. And what comes out of all of this, there are Talmudically saying over 900 readings of the first 28 letters. That's verse 1 of the Bible. There are over 900 ways of reading the same string of letters. We have one English translation. I think you get the idea that maybe there's a little more here than meets the eye. Why did we pick this one? Why is this the one that we thought was a good one? Well, one of the reasons is it tells a story. We love stories, right, John? <laughs> we love stories. 
And so it tells a story. And the story doesn't always make a whole lot of sense the first time you go through it. I agree. But it's one way of approaching it. And so this becomes an established way of doing it. It's not the only way of doing it. It is just an established way of doing it. For the most part, we in the West, the non judaic part of the West, we focused on that one translation, and we've taken the King James as the primary translation for the reason that John mentioned, and that, that I agree with wholeheartedly, is it just sounds so damn good. It, just, it goes down like oil, as the Germans say, because that's what they were supposed to do. When King James says translated, he says, I want a translation that is worthy of the text that's being translated. And so it had to sound exalted and profound and deep, and it does. And that's really what moves us. And so we've got that part of it. But what the text is actually saying or how it's saying it, it wasn't that it wasn't important because the King, King James Version is actually a, a pretty damn good translation. But I've been trying to learn B Biblical Hebrew for the last four years. I can tell you, it means a whole lot of different things depending on how you read it. When I was in uh, college, this was in, must have been 1968, I was working in a factory where my father worked. I was on second shift and there was a, a young man there who was also summer help, another college student. He was a seminarian at the uh, the local seminary at the Catholic College out in uh, La Trobe, not far from where I grew up. And we got to talking, and I said, you know, what do you like about what you're doing? And he goes, oh, I, actually, he wanted to be a priest, and that's why he was studying. It was a Catholic thing. He goes, but I almost quit seminary last year. And I said, why is that? And he goes, well, we learned to read the, the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek, and I had trouble reconciling what the original text said with what our translation said. And he went through a crisis of faith because it is so different from what it is that we, we think it says. And when, when my mother was thumping on the Bible, she was always thumping on King James. But she wasn't necessarily thumping on what might have been there. And sometimes the very small and subtle things, and I can spend, I spend a lot of time trying to translate one verse, believe me, um, because of the compactness of the language and the, and, and the, there's just so many details that you have to, to pay attention to. But it's because certain words can mean different things, just like we see at the bottom here. He created six, or he created a thorn. He created. Well, what does that six or thorn mean? What, why is that there? What, what could that possibly mean, and how does that have anything to do with heaven and earth? So these are the kinds of things that when you start getting into the language, start coming up, and they're really hard to grasp. And so a lot of the things that I do now enrich my understanding of the Bible, because like John, I, I've read it before. You can't, Marco, you mentioned it, you really can't study literature, world literature, Western literature without knowing something about it. The stories are constantly being referred to. Um, um, we used to play the old game as if you were going to be uh, lost on a desert island some way, what five books do you take with you? Well, the top two on my list were the complete works of Shakespeare and the Bible. <laughs> okay, and then, and then the other three were like, okay, we can argue about those, but those first two were going with. <laughs> because to me, they were the most complete statements of what it is that we think and understand and believe here in the West. Northrop Fry, uh, his book, The Great Code, goes through this whole thing and explains this from a literature, uh, literary critical uh, perspective as well that it's really hard to understand most of Western literature if you don't have an understanding of the Bible. And most of us get our understanding of the Bible through the back door by reading a lot of literature and going, well, what are they talking about? And then you see some commentaries or somebody mentions something and it helps fill in some of those gaps that we have. So this is the problem that we actually have is how do we parse the text and, and what is it really saying to us? How do, how do we know that our translation is right? We always have a problem with translations. We saw this in the Gapeser readings we did. That's why I was reading Sloterdijk in German. The English sounded wonderful. The German was absolute crap. You know, it was like, well, well what is this? You know? and, but I also know that the translator picked that one for whatever reason. It was a good choice. 
He made a readable text, which I think he needs to do. But we always have this problem with translation. Roberto Eco said the translation is the art of failure. Because you just never really get it all right. I'm sure that you know that as well, Marco. Um, you have to spend very little time in another culture that speaks another language until you realize it's a lot more nuanced and different than what we expect or what we would think. And we bring a whole lot with us when we, when we go there. And so from my own hermeneutic background in Gießen, I, my professor that I worked with was a very strong hermeneutic. It was always, you're bringing a lot to the text. What are you bringing? Get yourself out of the way. So you had to spend a lot of time thinking about what it, is it that I'm bringing here? What am I putting into this that doesn't really belong there? And how do I get it out? So those are some of the problems that I think that we have with, uh, with understanding texts as well. So now I'm going to, anybody have any questions uh, on that, that part? Because I'm going to jump into the Kabbalah right now. Because I, li I like that title. Yeah. Alternate Ways of Knowing. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, that's not familiar. I was trying to link this into everything that we were doing up to now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Now. You're not going to see this in any history of Kabbalah book. I can tell you that right now. This is Ed Mahood's own little presentation of how I would try to understand the field of Kabbalah. They inter they're not separate. This is an artificial construct. But I think there are three main flavors of Kabbalistic teachings. One of them is Merkava, which means chariot. And this is based on Ezekiel's vision of the chariot of God in the Bible one of the two books that is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Aramaic. It's the wheel of wheels and the images of the man, the four figures that the apostles are usually connected with in the, in the New Testament, the lion and the cherub and the, and, uh, and the bull, etc. They come from this vision in Ezekiel. This is often referred to in standard literature as ecstatic Kabbalah or mystical Kabbalah. This was probably the first, the first version of it. The mystical part of it was based on mantras that are built on the Hebrew letters and permutations of the Hebrew letters. So there's a connection between those. We also have what I would call standard Kabbalah, Tree of Life Kabbalah. This is the one that most people, if they're ever exposed to, would kind of get exposed to it all. There are 32 paths of wisdom. If you look at this little thing down here, the image, it's called the tree of life. It's got 10 balls that are hanging on them. They're called spheres of sephirot. And there are, there are 22 paths connecting those balls between each other, giving a total of 32. The main pur purveyor of that was a man by the name of Isaac Luria, known as the Ari or the lion. And this is also the one that is involved with uh, magic for the most part. If you run into any uh, chaos magicians, for example, in your in your paths, uh, most of them will, in some way, shape, or form, refer back to this uh, to this to this model. This model is a very very strong explanatory key. We're going to come back to it later in what we're doing, um, because this more or less describes the process of creation in kabbalistic terms, but it also it also provides relationships and ways of thinking about things um, that are very helpful in understanding anything that has to do either with the Bible um, and by consequence then Western literature or anything that is Bible related. And then there's another, there's another branch of Kabbalah where the focus is for the most part on the Hebrew letters themselves. I'm, this is the letter number code. This is what uh, uh, Marco also mentioned, a lot of uh, number symbology, a lot of relationships. Gematria is actually the word that um, is used there. Um, um, any, any word in Hebrew, Greek was the same way. Um, in the Roman numerals, the... Uh, the letter D is used for 500 because in Greek, the letter for 1,000, the word phi, the letter phi was uh, 1,000, and half of 1,000 is a D. And if you know what a phi is, it's a circle with a vertical um, line down the middle. So half of that looks like a D. That's how the, the Romans came up with their, their numbers. So 
there are these, these kind of relationships because at one time we used letters to represent numbers. Roman numerals weren't that way as well. So as we're going to see in just a moment, every Hebrew letter has a numerical value as well. And by using these numerical values, you can calculate this word has the same value as that word. They must be related in some way. Um, a real banal example is there are 613 uh, commandments in the Old Testament that a, that a, um, a believing uh, Jew should follow. Of these 613, men have to follow all 613. There happen to be 613 bones in the human body. So we have these little things, we go, oh, okay, I see how that relates. Uh, women, however, aren't required to follow all of those. They only have to require, uh, follow 248 of them because women are considered spiritually closer to God than men are, so they don't have to work as hard. They don't have as many commandments to follow. In the word, 248 numerates to the word for womb, oddly enough. So we have these little things, and you can play all kinds of games all day, and it's very entertaining, and sometimes it helps you along to gain an insight into something, and sometimes it's just distracting as well. So we're actually going to be following more this right-hand side, this letter Kabbalah, which I'm calling integral Kabbalah for a reason that you'll see in a, um, directly. Now... I mentioned the Sefer Yetzirah, that was one of the primary Kabbalistic books that comes up, and it's the oldest metaphysical essay in Hebrew, it was allegedly written by Abraham, first text show up around the 10th century. It's a very cryptic text, it's not very long, I'll show my book now, okay, <laughs> it's a real little book, this is the Amwork version with the uh, Hebrew on one side and the English on the other, and they still only get 50 pages together. You know, it's really short and it's very condensed. Um, it's an extended quasi commentary on Genesis 1 because this tells you how God did what he did. So that's why it's an extended commentary on that. And it's based on the fact that um, these 32 paths of wisdom. The tree of life that I just mentioned has 10 balls and 22 paths connecting them. That's 32 paths. They're considered the 32 paths of wisdom. And the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which we'll see in just a second, can be ascribed to those different paths. And this was all based on the fact that the word Elohim, you'll remember that in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. That word Elohim, which is the word that is translated as God in the English text, appears 32 times in that first account. And he also says, and God said, appears 10 times. That's how we have 10 sephirots, we have 32 paths of wisdom. These are the kinds of numerical associations that we're, that we're bringing together. And it just so happens that the word heart, love, in Hebrew, very similar to our word love in English, um, numerates to 32. We'll see that in just a second. So we have this, this text that gives us this whole description of planetary associations and zodiacal associations and days of the week and all these kinds of things. It's a very confusing text when you read it. If you think the, if you think the text of Genesis is a little, oh, okay, boy, um, this will really send you over the edge. But Ari Kaplan, who wrote a commentary on the, I'll show you another book. This is his version because he's got all six versions in here translated and commented on. This is on the bibliography, you'll be able to see that. Um, he says that what is being described in here is the creation of a um, 5D space, a five-dimensional space, because there are 32 apexes on a, on a 5D hypercube. So right, right here, when you start digging into, let's say, this esoteric side of things, we eventually start popping out in other realms that are much more familiar to us as moderns, for example, mathematical, Mark Frankel mentions a lot of things. You read some of Einstein or Heisenberg and you're going, I don't know, sounds a little mystical to me. And in a lot of regards it is, because there seems to be very, very close relationships between those things. And if you're like me and believe that everything is related to everything else, it's not unsurprising to stumble across things like that. So what may be described here, this is about how creation took place, maybe, maybe something other than just a, 
a six day, I'm going to put an earth together, separate waters and land, grow plants, have animals and, and put people on it. You know, it might be more than that. So those are the kinds of things that we need to need to think about. Now, I'm not going to go through these. Um, you can read these afterwards because they're just long text. But I put them in here because they're different ways of thinking about that string of letters and what it might mean and how they might relate to one another. Because that's what a lot of Kabbalah does. That's what the Sefer Yetzirah does. That's what Tree of Life. Kabbalah tries to do the mystical, the Merkava Kabbalah is more meditational, more inward looking, let's say, but they also use these Hebrew letters in order to create their mantras for those meditations that they do. So um, there's another page of these we'll go on because what we, what we kind of need to know, I'll just do the first one up here because Suarez, is, he's a letter Kabbalist in the 20th century. And he says, in the severity of its beginning in the first chapter, in its first verse, first chapter, Genesis 1, first verse, Genesis 1, 1, in its first sequence of number letters, all Hebrew letters are also numbers, is the seed, and in the seed is the whole. This whole can be and expected to be grasped in the Beit Resh Aleph Shin Yod Tav of Bereshit. The sequence is in the revelation and is the revelation. Well, if you think the Bible's cryptic, there's another one on top of that. But what he's saying is that each individual letter has a significance that goes far beyond what it is that we think it is as just letters. So, this is the alphabet, also read from right to left. You will notice that there are three sets of nine letters each. There's nine letters across the top on three rows. Every letter, like this first one up here, Aleph, upper right, means ox, has the number one, big, house, number two, and so it goes to Tate, which kind of looks like a snake or a serpent, number nine. Back to the second row, Yod is a finger, 10. So the names of the letters are kind of translations of what the Hebrew word says that describes it. Kaf is a palm of a hand, for example. Um, and so this is the way that they come up with doing all of that gematria. We, we saw that Lav, or Lev, depending on uh, where it is, is 32, because here's the Lamed, which is 30, and B, which is the second letter in that word, is 2. So 32 gives you 32 paths of wisdom. And this is at the heart of what it is that we're going to do. So this is what the, the alphabet looks like. This is one way to structure it so that it is easy to remember, amongst anything else. And it's based on these letters that we really want to take a look at the text of, uh, of Genesis. And so what I want to introduce to you now is um, the Meru approach. And Meru is the name of the Meru Foundation. It's an organization. The guy lives in uh, California now. He lives in Sharon, Massachusetts. For That's where he originally comes from. And he has been studying Genesis for the last, uh, let's see, it started in 1968. He started looking at it. He published his first article kind of about it in 1989. And he's been doing this ever since. This is all he does. He and his wife are in this foundation, and the only thing that they are, are, are looking at is the Hebrew text of Genesis and what it might mean. And he's come up with a few things based on some of these ideas that I just ran by you very quickly about letter codes and the numbers and the secrets. You see, there's this Kabbalistic teaching that says um, the secret of all creation is in the first letter of the Torah. But if you don't understand it and get it by grasping that first letter, it's in the first word. Well, we just saw it's hard to determine what is the first word. But if you don't get it in the first word, it's in the first verse. And if you don't get it in the first verse, well, it's in the first chapter. But if you don't get it in the first chapter, it's in the first book. And if you don't get it in the first book, it's in the whole of the Torah. So Hashem, God, in all of his infinite wisdom, is telling you 
This is the secret of creation. Here it is right before your eyes. All you have to do is understand it. Well, I kind of agreed with Stan. Stan Tenen is the guy who's doing the work here. I agreed with Stan. He goes, looking at the first letter really doesn't give me the secret of creation. I'm not getting it. No. So what he did is he said, I'll look at the first verse and see if that makes some kind of sense. And so that's why we're going to do this view from the inside out now. We're going to kind of take a look at what he's what he was talking about. And his explicitly stated goal is to understand what the original Hebrew or Aramaic is actually saying, I love these words, by looking through the translation. That sounds very diaphanous to me. That's very Gapesarian, although I know he doesn't know Gapesarian or by attempting to integrate the common meaning behind several different translations. What he's looking for is what is invariant about this text that always remains true no matter how you portray it, no matter how you express it in Hebrew or how you translate it. What is at the root that never, ever, ever changes? That's what he's looking for. And he's, and what I like about what Stan does is he refuses to just take the best, what looks like the best reason at the time. He is extremely rigorous in what he's doing. This man has spent the last 40 years of his life running around from one mathematical, because he does a lot of geometry things we're going to see in a moment, but running around from one mathematical faculty to another saying, this is what I found. Tell me what I did wrong. It shouldn't be that way. What's wrong with it? Disprove it. Falsify it. He insists on scientific, according to our general understanding of what science is all about, verifiability, irrefutability, and invariance. And one of the other criteria is it says he has to be co coherent, consistent, and elegant. It has to always be the simplest form. If there's any extraneous assumptions, anything I'm kind of throwing in from the side to make it work, then that's not good enough for him. And it took him until 2011 to even publish his first book called The Alphabet uh, Changed the World. This is also in the bibliography. But the Alphabet that Changed the World because he was so hesitant to go to the general public until he had acceptance in the scientific and religious communities. He spends a lot of time in Israel working with, with, with Torah scholars and rabbis about things that he's finding out about the texts and what he's communicating to them, because if they're not satisfied and the scientific community isn't satisfied, then he's not satisfied. It has to be acceptable to everyone across the board. And this is where I see a real life example of a person who's trying to bring the scientific and religious community to the same table. We actually agree that there's more here, or we agree at what we're looking at. That's what he's trying to do by looking through the text to this, this invariance. And he's, and he's adamant about it. He's, he's, it, I've never seen a person who was so, so dedicated to what he does as Stan Penner. And I've, I've, had the opportunity to, to visit him a couple of times when I was in California, and he was there as well. Uh, he makes models for everything. Uh, I'll give you some links later so that you can look at some of the models that he's made and some of the things that's come up. He also has YouTube videos that explain a lot of this, so anything that, that I don't make clear, and I'll, I'll probably garble more than I do make clear before it's all over, um, can also be um, looked at and, and thought about as well. So what he did... He said, let's look at the first verse of Genesis. So I put it back up on the, on the screen here for you. That's that string of 28 letters that we looked at to begin with. All right? That's the one that reads, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the reason he took this, he said, this is a meaningful unit for the following reasons. There are 27 letters followed by the 27th letter of the alphabet. I'm going to skip back real fast to show you. If you look kind of this Y-looking thing, it's a final form. It's the same as another letter in the alphabet, but it's only used at the end of words. 
So this is something that was introduced into the text that became very helpful for defining where words might be. That's the one at the bottom, lower left-hand side of the screen. It's the very last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's that tzadi. And it is the last letter of the word ha'aretz. I'm going to go back to our original text. Yeah. If you look at that first string, you see it. It says the earth, ha'aretz. What you notice as well is if you go to verse 2, there's a little line, and then the word ha'aretz appears again. You have the same string of letters, the same string of four letters after that little upright as you do at the end of the first line. And what he's saying is, this looks like to be, this looks like to be a unit, because I have this word followed by the same word as a kind of handoff to the next idea that's coming. So it makes sense to look at this 28-letter string as a single unit. And that's what he's, what he's looking at, and that's what we're going to look at now. Sorry for the jumping, but this is why it is. So what we have is 27 letters followed by the 27th letter. He was a physics major, so he thinks in mathematical, physical terms to begin with, but He's also an excellent visual pattern recognizer. And he said, looking at this, well, there must, there's a pattern in here somehow. I don't know exactly what it is. And when he went off and asked some of his mathematical friends about it, they said, well, we don't know anything about it. It must be Kabbalah. So we go off and read a lot of Kabbalah. But we also saw that that doesn't really get us a lot further in and of itself. So he said, I need to go back and look at this for sure. And so what he has is 27 is 9 times 3 or 3 times 3 times 3 or 3 cubed. It's a very nice, compact, mathematical form, you know. So I've got these 27 letters being told, look at these 27 letters. Here's, here's the 27th letter after the 27 letters. Look at this 27, you know. That's what he said. Somebody's telling me, look at 27, okay. How do you look at 27? <laughs> well, this is what I admire so much about Stan, he pasted all the letters on a Rubik's cube because <laughs> a Rubik's cube has 27 cubes on it. And so you can put these letters on there. And he said, well, the way you do that is you count in base three. So now I have this chart of the Hebrew letters again. And you notice that this bottom line is in base three. So Aleph is zero, zero, zero. He's looking for something geometrical and zero, zero, zero is the origin. Eight would be zero, zero, one, zero, zero, two. We have no three, so now I have to go to zero, one, zero. That's how you count in base three. And so, so, so he said, and, and, and it all fits. It all, it all fits on the cube. All right. So he said, it only took him 10 years to get here. <laughs> and he spent, I don't know how long, he tried this with other base systems, it didn't work, but for some reason, the base three system seems to work. He put them on there. And so what you get is this picture on the left, where he, it, this is kind of split apart so you can see how it is, but he put them all on there. And then he says in one of his, uh, in, in, in his video, in an act of desperation, <laughs> he goes, I really didn't know what else to do. I removed every letter from the cube that wasn't in that first verse. And he ended up with this figure on the left, which is a schematic dry diagram of the figure that he has. He shows you a 3D version of this in his, in his uh, talk. And the one thing that you notice about this diagram, it's an odd diagram, no doubt about it. It's got one axis of symmetry. And he goes, oh, that's kind of interesting. He was in California at the time, ran over to Berkeley, see one of his friends. He goes, what are the chances that if I do this and blah, 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 I'll end up with a figure that has one axis of symmetry? And as it turns out, I think the chances are about one in 300. Okay, it's not a done deal, but it's way better than chance. <laughs> it sh what we have is, well, it shouldn't be, but it is. And the thing that then is interesting about it when you look at it He's got the, the base three numbers on here. But if you look over on right in the middle, if you take that 
right in the middle of the horizontal plane. You'll see that very hard to read. But over here on the left, you see a 210. And on the right, you see 012, which is the mirror image of what's on the left-hand side of that symmetry axis. And the same applies if you go up to the, the next little nibby above it, where you see the 011, on the other side is 110. These are the letters associated with those, with those uh, base three numbers. That shouldn't be at all. I mean, that you end up with one symmetry axis is one thing, that you end up with one that actually reflects the symmetry that's in there. Seemed to him to be a little much. And the ones that are all on this vertical axis, which is the symmetry axis, if you look at the numbers that are in there, they are all symmetrical to themselves. 222, 212, 202, 000. And so I end, he ends up with a lot more symmetry than he bargained for. Simply based on taking his desperate act of putting the letters on the Ruby cube and taking everything off that wasn't in Genesis 1. This shouldn't happen. So after a long time at looking at this, he realized, and now we lay this down, that there are symmetry pairs within that first verse. Here again is that first verse broken down into two rows, and I have simply color-coded where within this text itself, symmetrical letters appear before and after in the verse. It's very interesting because there are seven pairs of letters. Now, I know that the, the Jeffrey was a little wigged out about um, Arthur Young and his seven-ness kind of thing. And I can tell you that uh, Stan was also a little bothered. But why would it be seven? Um, Arthur Young would say, well, why wouldn't it be seven? Because <laughs> there's seven that's all around this. And one of the nice things about uh, Stan, he, he worked together with Arthur Young for a long time. Arthur was involved in aspects of this, and he's based a lot of his model on his own model. Stan's Meru model is based on the process model from Arthur Young for this very reason. So now we have these symmetry pairs. And we can look at this in another way. If we look at that first verse again, that's across the top, is that string of letters. Here he's shown where these letters drop out, and so we have a green bar where we have what ends up to be, this is the squiggly as an R, so we have R, R, L, a lot of stuff, and then the R again. And then the next one we find, there's a T, T, V, T, and then there's an H, H, M, H. And then down here at the bottom, the pattern sort of reverses, and it goes Y, B, Y, Y. So you have a symmetry pattern that's running through the text, and then all of a sudden you have one that reverses around the other way. And what he found very interesting was that if you take that very first letter, this B, and you kind of jam it into that Y part of that, that sadi at the end, you end up with a big a big A. A is the first letter of the alphabet, but it doesn't appear as the first letter of the text. The B does. So what he has is these recurring symmetry groups that more or less show this, this string turns back in on itself. And the, the geometric figure that turns back in on itself is a torus. Because when it's the only, it is the smallest self-contained differentiation model going. So when you puff into that cosmic jello, if you will, and it builds the ring that folds in on itself, the first verse of Genesis, in the beginning God created in the heaven and the earth, wraps up into, it looks like, the very thing that it's talking about. In other words, the text itself is self-referential. What he also found from these symmetry groups, well, we'll see this in just a second, is that by aligning these groups these ways, 
if there is a letter missing in the text, the text can autocorrect itself. You know what goes there based on the symmetry patterns of the letters. There is, and this has been confirmed by all of the math people he's been talking to, there is letter level coding throughout the entire Torah. At the letter level, it is self-correcting and self-referential. In other words, there's intelligence in the text. This is why, for those of you who might be wondering, why I was so fascinated by, by uh, what's her name? Jude the uh, Curry Vans. It's all information. It comes down to information, you see, because you need information to know which information you need to know. But the text provides, provides that. So there's, there's a lot more to the actual the text itself as it's there than meets the eye. So there's another teaching in Kabbalah, but it's also in, the, in Judaism itself. It says the Torah itself is so unique, you can't compare it to anything in the world. It is so unique, the only thing you could ever compare it to is itself. And it was based on that that he says, okay, then I'll put all of the letters in the Bible. This is this left-hand picture over here. I'll put all of the letters in that first verse on beads on a string, and I'll, I'll wrap it around so that I auto-correlate it to itself. And what you get, and on the right-hand side, is in fact the, the stylized version of what you see on the left, is this wrapping back in on itself to Taurus structure. And it is and this is Stan's word, the tightest coherent pattern that accounts for all letters, fits on the surface of two tours, six turns around, one turn through, corresponds to seven regions that mathematically define, I have to do my editing before I post this, that mathematically define the surface of the two tours. It is self-referential. It tells you what it is. This is what comes out of the text. And he goes, well, that shouldn't be either. When he goes around and he runs, goes to his mathematical friends, they're going, nah, that shouldn't be that at all. But what do you do with it? It's there. Now, as we have often talked, you can reduce these higher dimensional forms to lower dimensional forms. Young talks about the, the volume of the two torus is like the surface of a three torus and the next higher dimension and things like that. But what you can do is you can reduce this, and that's why I end up here with this tetrahedron. I'm taking this really quick here. It's the static form of the two torus. It's the simplest, most symmetric of all the platonic solids. It has seven symmetry axes. These correspond to the seven areas of the color map. And this little squiggly thing that you see in the middle is the vector that defines the color map on the two torus. For a mathematician, you could take that vector off and say, well, here's the torus because that's all I need to know to define it. And this little squiggly is interesting because it has no symmetry. I've mentioned this somewhere else, but it has no symmetry anywhere. And this is what Stan refers to as naked recursion. It's nothing but recursion. It is simply always referring back to itself. And the thing that is so interesting about this little squiggly, when you put it in this tetrahedron, it kind of looks like a tent, you know? There's also a Kabbalistic teaching that says when the light is lit in the tent of meeting, Hashem will, will appear, will be amongst you. And there's another one that says that when the flame is wedded to the coal, Hashem, God, will be amongst you. And he says, well, this kind of looks like a flame, and coal is tetrahedrally structured, so that kind of fits as well. So we have, we have images and metaphors that are being used in the literature that are actually finding verification in mathematical structures. And the thing that I find so fascinating about all of this is when he got here, and this took him a long time as well, depending on how you turn this tetrahedron, if you shine a light on it, what you see as shadowgrams on the wall are the Hebrew letters. It tells you what it is, and it tells you how to write it as well. And from this, he has developed what he calls the first hand. And that's this little thing that he's got on 
which you can see in his hand, this is a one finger version on the left. This is the right hand pictures and there's a four finger version on the right. And you can hold these things in your hand and you can move them to point however you like in three dimensional space. And when you do, you would see in your mind's eye, because we know where we're pointing, shadow grams of the Hebrew letters. So you can act, you can gesture this way. So what we find interesting, you'll have noticed on the uh, Hebrew alphabet, I had the letters were differently colored. There were three that were brown, there were seven that were blue, and the other ones were black. Because it says in the Sefer Yetzirah that the text is divided into three mother letters, seven double letters, and 12 single letters. Well, we can see how this 3712 format appears on how these different Taurus knots, which is what he's actually referring to, that's of these squigglies that are in there because they define the Taurus itself, break down. In other words, there's, there's a high degree and a high level of intelligence embedded in the text as well. So it tells you what it is and it tells you what it's for and by, by using these things, he has put together, I'm showing you, you don't have to look at this in, the, in detail, but he shows you how to make all of the hand gestures so that if, for you looking at it, you would see the letter, and for a person who's looking at you, they would see the letter in your left hand, and you would see the letter in your right hand. So there are, he has developed hand gestures for all of the letters of the alphabet, and it turns out that most of them are self-defining as well. So when you say the word mouth, you put your hands like this. When you want to letter the word gaga, which is round, you do this, which is kind of gesturing what it is. And it turns out that these gestures are very similar to gestures even that blind people use who don't know about gestures because even blind people gesture when they speak. When, when uh, Jude Curry Van was doing her talk, John had mentioned, she has this wonderful expression that she has with her hands. And she does, because most of us do, even non-Italians. She's English, but she's got this whole thing going. And I found it interesting that the more she's digging into her cosmology, I think the more expressive in her gesture she's becoming. That is just a reaction on my part. This has nothing to do with what in fact may be there. So what this means is, you could, in fact, gesture the text. But anything that you can put into this form, where that hand is, where you can imagine that there would be this, this vortex that gives you the shattergrounds of the letters, you could do in any form at all with your body. And so it is also more than conceivable. It's likely, it's actually, I think, to be recommended, you could dance the text. You can gesture the text. There's a relationship between these gestures and tones of music as well. You can, you can play the text as music. I don't have that on here now, but uh, uh, maybe at a, some other time we can do that. And you can, you can listen to the text as music. Sten, Tenen thinks he also knows how to define and build the instruments that are used to make that music because all of the instructions are in the text. There's lots of other things about the text that we as Westerners really don't associate with. If you go through, for example, the uh, Garden of Eden story, depending on how you choose letter patterns going through, give, a given algorithm will give you only tree names or only fruit names or only animal names. It kind of tells you what's in the garden because the text, the text tells you. It, it's in the text as well. So what we have here is not just an abstract, well, this text is like that, and then the first story they say this, and then the second story they say that. But we have, we have a model and an approach and an understanding that goes much deeper than that, that doesn't vary depending on what it is that you think you're looking at, because I'm always showing you the same thing. And I think this has very, very far-reaching consequences for a lot of things that we do. I think it's also very clear that if this is in fact true as stated, which I'm not going to claim and Stan doesn't claim, but it seems to be heading in this direction, we need to look at this more, and he's, he's continuing to work on this with other people, there's a lot of things we need to rethink. 
because this does actually change a lot of how we understand what we understand. So just to kind of pick up on this, as I told you, there were two accounts of creation in the Bible. The word used for God in the first story is Elohim. That's the one that we looked at. But the one that Sloterdijk used, the word Elohim does not appear anywhere. There the word I have Hashem, it's the tetragrammaton, that's the four-letter name of God. That's the one that appears in the second creation story. So I have two stories about creation where two different words referring to God are used. Now in our English translations, we only have one word there. We have God here and we have God there. But in the original text, there are two. And what comes out of this further is... This Elohim is the term that is used to more or less describe the most expansive whole aspect of God. The other word, Hashem, is the most singularly compact form of that. You have, and, and this is why we also had our talk on singularity. A singularity, for example, in sound would be infinite amplitude, zero duration. There would be a pulse. It could be the big bang or the big puff or the big whatever. That would be a singularity because there's infinite contrast. And the whole secret to creation lies in what that first letter in the Hebrew alphabet tells us, the bait, because that is the word for house. And it defines the difference between inside and outside. And without this definition, without this distinction, this very primary distinction, this is what Curry Van says is a bit. Others say it's a bit. That's why we that's how she gets to the information part of it. But this distinction between inside and outside is the absolute fundamental notion that we need to grasp for understanding all of creation. And it's based on the idea of infinite contrast. So, out of this, and this is just for further interest and edification, out of this you will see this little dark figure in the center of the, his model of continuous creation is the four-fingered loopy thing that he's got stuck in his hand. And in order to define this apple-looking thing, which is the model itself, you need six hands. You need six hands, and the thumbs will always be in the center. So you have six items plus one in the center, and six plus one are seven again. We come back to seven. But he believes that these, that this describes the symbology and the metaphoric of all the Abrahamic religions. He calls it here in the center. You can hardly read it here. You can see it better when I give it to you. You can magnify it. This is the tree. This is your gradze drill in the... Um, Nordic tradition, for example, this is the tree of life. These are the waters above and below that are talked about in the second uh, verse of Genesis because there's a plane in the center, the earth plane, so to speak. This is also the Emerald tab Tablet of Hermes. He has an article on that in one of his books. Um, this, up here in the upper right-hand corner, just the second image down, is the star and crescent, which also comes because there's a star of seeds in the center of the apple. That's why the apple is generally considered the fruit of the fall. It doesn't say apple in the Bible. It just says fruit. We've all decided in the meantime that it's an apple, and probably for good reason. Um, apple is also in the, in the Greek pantheon uh, for Apollo which comes from Apollon, which means not many, a one. That's, that's what his, uh, his name actually means. So we have all of these, these ideas, these notions that keep coming back and can be, I'm not saying explained, but can be demonstrated and more easily comprehended on the basis of this geometric model that he has come up with. This is where things actually for my way of thinking at any rate, right, starts to make sense. And they're all related to this geometric metaphor which he's been able to pull out of the text. 
this is a a double page is also um, better to look at, but taking s sections of the figures that you see down here in the lower right hand corner in the middle, you see the Cairo, which is a symbol used for Christ. Uh, he's the only person I know who's been able to explain why we use the form we do for a heart. Because when you look down the apple, you see a heart from the, from the swirls that interlock with one another from the tourist knots. Um, this figure over here is another form of the, um, of the, the Taurus knot and the Taurus itself play. If you, if you mapped it onto a cube, it would look like that. What's interesting about this one is, um, you went, there are, there are six Alephs in the text and they all line up with the corners. And the seventh one that gets generated when you put the ends together ends up in the middle. Now, what is interesting as well is he's done a little bit of work. He hasn't done a lot of work in this regard, but the models that he's developed apply as well to the Greek text of the New Testament and to the Arabic that is used in the Quran. All of these texts are probably telling us to say there are slightly different variations on the model, just like this cube model is used. You notice that these kind of double loops, you can't get a, a beta without having another loop. But, but it looks like he's not researching this. He's Jewish, okay? <laughs> so he's not going to touch it. But he does say they've done some looking at it, and there seems to be letter-level coding in the New Testament as well, at least in the Gospels. And in all likelihood, it's in the, in the Arabic as well. So... That's why he's claiming that this is a universal metaphor for creation. This is a universal um, imagery um, that can be used to understand things that we have. When we read the text, we don't really get it. But when we start thinking of it in these terms, it starts making more sense. Uh, some of the geometric forms that come out of this, for example, are the cuboctahedron, uh, is it, uh, no, the duodecahedron. That's one sphere surrounded by 12 other spheres. That's how you geometric, geometrically get it. If you have a sphere and you want to enclose it so that you can't see the middle sphere, you need 12 to enclose it. Well, all of our Abrahamic religions have uh, Jesus and the 12 disciples. We have Moses and the 12 tribes of Israel. We have Muhammad and the 12 imams. We all have a 112, the 112. If you're going to enclose that next layer with spheres, you need 42 of them. Um, there's a 42-letter name of God that is particularly sacred to the Jews, for example. So we start getting the numbers, we get the symbology, we get the imagery, and they seem to form a coherent pattern that permeates all of the text and would under, our understanding of the text. And that's, that's the basic idea I wanted to at least expose you to. I don't expect that anybody grasped any of this. I did add some bibliography uh, references, including a, um, I, will, I will post the thing once I make the uh, necessary changes. But that's basically what I wanted to at least have you see this evening. Another view of Genesis, not the one you're used to. Thank you. So, okay. didn't quite make it to half past, Doug. <laughs> Well, why don't we then just take a quick pause, uh, Doug? Um, if you have to go, you you can sneak out, or um, if there's anything you wanted to. Uh, I suppose ask. I'll sneak out in about ten or fifteen minutes. Um, okay, I, I've extended my stay here. Uh, okay, for good reason. Um, uh, well, let, let me. Let me Is ask this you like an you. open open? Yeah, so, now I'm I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Talking. Okay. How about it? Well, Doug, do, would you want to, uh, if you have anything, uh, go first, uh, respond uh, before you have to leave? Yes, uh, my mind always wants to go to the quick slapstick, one 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 time humorous comment, but uh, I think I'll stick with the the first letter rather than the <laughs> the uh, the first phrase there. But no, no, I really appreciate this. Um, it's quite in depth. It's clearly 40 years of this guy's work 
mm. put into image there. Um, so those images, I think, will definitely resonate with at just glancing at them and trying to decipher no, no, the, no. the 900 symbols that are within each one <laughs> uh, really, no. really intrigues me. Um, it's it, And it's cryptic, yet at the same time, it's pretty lucid. It's mm. um, I, I can see what it is, and it's very interesting. I don't have too many comments at this time. But I, I do have web links to both his site, the uh, Mero Foundation site, and uh, um, and there there's a link to the YouTube channel where you can you can he he does a much better job of presenting this than I do. Is that Tenen? Time to do it. What's his first name? Scott. Dan. Dan Tenen. Stan Tenen. T e n e n. Okay, so he's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, he's on YouTube. Oh, yeah, there's. His, uh, he has a five uh, DVD set of uh, videos that he did on uh, the, the one, though I put it in a thing, it's the uh, geometry of um, creation, um, I think it's called. I don't know. Yeah, and then there's a matrix, yeah, the geometri- uh, ge- geometric, met- <laughs> geometric metaphors of life is really the best video to start with because this is the one where he explains how he got to where he got. Geometric metaphors. metaphors of life. Yeah, it's, it'll be in the bibliography on the uh, slides I put up there for you. I noticed I need a proofreader. I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm debating internally. Um, you can do it externally. Too. <laughs> well, where just just whether and how uh, to bring in the skeptical point of view, uh, who may or anywhere may is fine. Uh, and well, th- the reason is only because uh, there's such an emphasis on a mathematical reasoning, on mm-hmm. extrapolation uh, from uh, certain qualities or discernible you know, facts in the like, source material, the text, to uh, other you know, symbolic systems, uh, geometrical, numerological, etc., and then viewing and manipulating those systems in a way mm-hmm. manipulating might be to tinge the a judgment in there but analyzing mm-hmm. what's I, just, I know what you mean um using your hand to turn way, exactly such mm-hmm. that they yield they produce generate uh, dis, uh, uh intelligible forms mm-hmm. uh and patterns uh, and and then going from that observation uh, to uh, what I think is an implicit claim being made, maybe a motive even for doing all this work, you know, it takes a certain level of obsession, uh, obviously, to uh, really unpack uh, what seems to be implicit or latent, uh, encoded, uh, and compressed, you know, into the text. To, there's a there's a it seems to be a, a, an attempt to make a claim that there's you said that this in as many words more going on here than a contingent narrative arising out of you know one historical situation that could have been any number of other historical that you know that 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 there is an ex, that there are no extra words that wouldn't potentially theoretically at least fit within these, this pattern, mm-hmm. that it has consistency. It shows some of the qualities of what we would associate with code, uh, would suggest that it's, uh, had the origin of the text itself is, is not just contingent human beings in a you know, sort of uh, unmoored historical process, but seems, would seem to have a source um, that is... Uh, um, uh, Transcendental to that, let's just say transcendent. Uh, I mean, the closest analogy that would come to mind is the genetic code DNA. So mm-hmm. if we were to look at a genetic sequence, it wouldn't make any sense at first. It would just be A, G, C, T, and various combinations. But then through study and research uh, and experimentation, everything that you know, genet- the science of genetics has been doing for the past you know, 50 years especially, but you know, going back to Darwin and around that time, is, uh, is decoding the code to understand how the, these particular combinations of chemicals and nucleotides uh, give rise to or provide the information for 
the construction of biological beings. So the question that would come to mind, just, you know, again, going with this on the sort of hypothetical tack still, is if it is true that this is not just a narrative or a text, but it's also a code, the question would be, what is it a code for? Uh, we understand that genetic you know, DNA is a code for biological organisms. What is the Bible a code for? Uh, mm -hmm. If it, you know, b because from the skeptical, rational, modern perspective, which is looking at the text on the basis of its mythological character, uh, you know, we we could say that th these stories are what make up culture, and they, you know, drive our conceptions of ourselves, our place in the world or in the universe, etc. And you could read it in that way and, you know, take a literary studies kind of approach to it or a, um, a humanities kind of approach, a humanistic approach to it. That's not exactly what this is. Uh, this is looking at some um, design for, you know, lack of another, a, a better word, uh, and potentially... Um, let's say, uh, pointing to a designer, an architect, uh, a coder. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, in that metaphor, we don't imagine code as just spontaneously emerging. It mm -hmm. produces, it, it issues from a coder and, you know, a cult, people who, who, who do that. So who would code this uh, so that it would be, it would have these kind of multidimensional uh, realities to it could be read as a story it could be read as metaphor but then could be read as math and but what's that math for would be my question what's actually being coded uh, and I don't I don't know if there's been thinking down around there but uh, I would be curious about that because if it's if it's just you know interesting correlations and I mean then that's interesting but um, it doesn't lend itself to any kind of I think necessary insight into like the manifest world, whereas uh, obviously genetics does. You know, we can uh, change the genome of a, of a species. We can create new species. Of eventually, presumably, we'd be able to do that. What would we do, would we do with this code if we understood it? Uh, what you is create musical instruments? Is what it is. <laughs> For example, one could, huh? but that's, I, I don't think that's exactly what uh, Marco's driving at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I have to go, um, but. Yeah, I'm, I, I like what Marco's saying, and uh, I'll hopefully I can listen to this later. But yeah, I see it as just what Marco's saying, but he's giving much better words as mm -hmm. mathematical proof for the creator. And this is the best presentation I've ever seen for that, that proof. Mm -hmm. um, that's all I have to say. Goodbye. Uh, thanks, Doug. Yeah, yeah. Always a pleasure, Thank Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Bye, John. We'll see you on Thursday, right? Yes, definitely. Okay, looking forward. I, I just can I can I respond? Right, go ahead. Yeah. This is all way over my head, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have some intuitions about it. Um, and just to respond a little bit to the the DNA um, that you were mentioning, uh, the DNA. It's not a, it's, I think we've been brought up to think of DNA as like a top-down model. The DNA um, gives messages to the, the, to the cell and the organism. And I think that's a real distortion. Um, I think there are a, a much, some advances are being made that imply that this, it's much more organic and holistic than that original um, Watt, Crick and Watson um, metaphor because they were coming out of the 50s when everything was top-down models <clears throat> that's what they were looking for and it's much more about the RNA, the DNA, the so-called junk DNA which they're finding out actually the cell uses um, the information and can change the information and that the um, you know, that the membrane of the cell is determining what goes in and out through that membrane. And there's an inside of the membrane and there's an outside of the membrane. And this is extremely complex. So I think when we use the DNA metaphor, the way Dennett and Dawkins and Sam Harris and a lot of these AI enthusiasts do, I think they're 
using very primitive, old school, first level AI. And I think we've gone much further. And this is what I think uh, Finkel, uh, Finkel, I can't pronounce his name, the Russian dude. Frankel. Yeah, the mathematician and others are saying, you know, you, you guys are like leaving out quantum mechanics. You know, you're really leaving out third level cybernetics, all about observing systems. How do we observe observing systems? The whole notion of self-reflexivity, um, all of that is like put aside and ignored. So these uh, elaborate AI um, schemes can be concocted where there's no consciousness. Consciousness isn't necessary. We can put that aside too. <laughs> and uh, this is all I think uh, laughable, except it's not so laughable because some people are taking them seriously and that's very tragic. Mm -hmm. And I just feel the, um, so I, I just want to like appreciate that, that, the, that, the use of the, of that, that metaphor, um, I think, and the selfish meme idea, it uh, creates enormous distortions. Um, also, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there because I haven't figured this out yet, but I thought it was so fascinating what you talked about, um, the, the gestural, the movement, the dance, the music, the sound, and how there's, to me, like a synesthesia, overlapping sensory systems are operating here. And that is also, I think, what happens when we're dealing with writing, reading, vocalizing. Um, there was a, some educator in France said that we can just skip reading out loud and just go to reading silently. And they found out that children can't read silently unless they've learned how to read out loud. <laughs> it seems so obvious, but it seems like these AI people think that way too. Well, let's just skip all these steps and just hit the jackpot. You know? And I think the, the vocalizing, the making of sound and gesture are so related to one another. And when we talk, we're pointing to what we're, we use our our hands and our bodies to communicate to whoever we're communicating with um, where all of this is in our perceptual space. And we give it a rhythm. We mm. give it a tempo. We can slow it down or we can speed it up. But, but um, and you know, if you sit on your hands, it's really hard to talk. You know, you need to have that. So mm. there's a deep relationship between the, the mimetic, the gestural, the the vocalization, and then we, we turn it into a different kind of code so we can write, and then we can read, and then we can enter into other worlds that, you know, people who have written texts, they've, they've died and gone a long time ago, but we can read them, and we can enter into the mind of a Plato, or we can even, when we recite a text by Shakespeare, we recite one of his sonnets, you know, I'm in that world. I'm also because I use my tongue and my teeth and my larynx and my lungs and I can uh, oh, uh, um, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, that, pentam you know, that iambic pentameter. What's the difference? between myself and Shakespeare. I've entered into the mind of Shakespeare through my own, through my physiology and through the, the way he's uh, pasted. And so I think these are very complex issues, but I think, uh, you know, that uh, I think we can make the confusion when we try to, I think we have to look at the interplay of math, language and logic. They all are emerging out of this gestural um, breathing um, creature in an environment that's trying to make sense with others, both human and non-human, we're trying to make sense. And what's that Rosetta Stone? What can be, how, how do we translate between the, all of these incommensurabilities? <clears throat> I think that's what these, that's what I'm getting from your presentation um, and um, this guy I want to look up and how so many, uh, 
th- th- there's some other people besides the uh, Curavan and Frinkle, and there's someone else I just uh, uh, picked up who's really very interesting. I can't remember her name, but I was listening to a talk of hers, and she had a near-death experience. Mm-hmm. And in the near-death experience, she saw all these uh, geometrical relationships, and then uh, in topological forms, and she was able to um, draw them. And she presented them. She was a non-mathematician. She presented them to Lou Kaufman, who's like the leading uh, mathematician in the field of uh, knots and uh, topology. And he looked at this stuff and she said, prove me right or wrong. What's going on here? And she, he, they, they did a, a study and all these are coming out of, um, I, I'm not a topologist, but the, he, he, she got some confirmation that this was all very legitimate because she was given and she was told, you know, go back and bring this with you. <laughs> and I want to read her book um, because I, I just think that the, the, the people are working the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension. Um, I think that there's something about that uh, being and, and the, you know, the Mobius strip, the Taurus, the, the Klein bottle, all these paradoxical, paradoxical analogs. Um, I think this is a very rich and fertile area to study. And even in our, of uh, the little experiments that we did uh, with clean language, uh, where, you know, uh, where is that? Does it have a size or shape? What kind of is that? Looking for the qualities and then having to, and then find it in your perceptual space on the inside, on the outside or somewhere in between, very important, knowing what's in and out and the in-between. Um, and then having to draw a picture. I think that's so, what we're doing is we're shifting from the, ling- from the language mm. and then we're drawing. And I think you mentioned that it's going from 3D to 2D was, was a challenge for you. How to put that on a on a flat piece of paper, mm-hmm. and then how to re- then to return from that two D experience to a three D experience? I believe what happens is we contact a fourth and a fifth. I think something that we can't put, we can't find words for yet. But I think there's, and I think maybe something that you mentioned too about experience. Um, this isn't just like. Uh, signifiers floating around you know it's it's coming you know we have to embody and i think we're in a danger dangerous zone because we're tending to uh the 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 perceptual and the conceptual are are uh, disconnected profoundly in our culture um that's why we get these nut jobs who are saying you know there's no such thing as consciousness you don't need it (laughs) i'm i'm just like throwing this out because I don't know where to go with all this. There's just so much information, except for my own research purposes, I think. Um, and the community we're trying to, uh, you know, to, uh, to establish here is, uh, I think it'd be very uh, interesting if we could find connections between our different research projects. And, uh, you know, if, if there are any connections and if they are, what are they, you know? Um, because I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm using clean language in a very, um, I'm not in, I'm interested in it as a, a, to use it for research purposes, how to get clean, clear phenomenological investigation going on. Uh, I don't think Heidegger did this very well. I think the phenomenologists, Sartre, all of them, they sucked at phenomenology. <laughs> they were not good at it at all. And I'm, I'm just wanting to be a part of this movement to uh, um, reinvent phenomenology mm-hmm. so that it can be a useful tool. Uh, and I believe that these mathematicians, these logicians, they're working with this. As, they're working with, you know, what's the underneath all of this? There must be something that uh, our, our language, our math, our logic emerges out of. And I was just reading a logic book. He says it can't be, and language can't come before logic. There has to be, oh, math cannot come. Excuse me. Math cannot come before logic. There already has to be logic. And it seems to me that there's a lot has to be logic must come out of to some extent our embodiment. There's a logic of action. If I see a man running down the street and then I see a bus coming, 
I conclude that the man is running to catch the bus. Now, I may be wrong. He might be running away from someone who, running towards someone who robbed him. But there's a logic that's already there before I formulate any words or turn it into a story. So walking down the street and seeing, um, I think I mentioned this in a, something I posted, I saw a man shivering in the cold on mm. uh, a, a heap, you know, he was eating out of a box and a, a, and a woman came by and she bent over him and she handed him a $20 bill and he looked at her like, Where, are you from Mars or something? He was baffled. And then she took his hand, she put a $20 bill in it and she put her hand over it and she walked away. And that's when I felt myself move to tears <laughs> but i know no words were said it was totally nonverbal, and yet and it took two seconds and i was as i was walking down the street but it just hit me like a tsunami but i'm also thinking about the bible and the par the parables in the old testament you know jesus is uh, the parable of the good samaritan and i knew these I knew this woman was a, a God-fearing Christian. <laughs> she just exuded. <laughs> she was a black woman, you know, and I could tell, I may be wrong, but I got this, to me, it was a very, there's a template there. And it was all nonverbal, but I, I was able to draw upon it to make sense of this exchange. So anyway, I hope I'm explaining something mm -hmm. to myself or to it's something that you guys could respond to. Um, but anyway, that's what's was that, that that's the kind of that's, that's been triggered by this mm -hmm. uh, presentation today. So I'm very grateful. Um, it's left me with a whole lot of questions. So I hope that's useful to you, useful feedback for you, Ed. Oh, I always find it wonderful when other people are full of questions. <laughs> yeah. <absolutely. laughs> And um, don't forget to post a reference to the book that you don't know the title of before you forget about the woman and the, that you're reading. Oh, yes. yes. I'm going to put that up. She's written, she's that's written that's absolutely of essential. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, you mentioned Kaufman from Illinois, the mathematician. I think yes. he's on the board of Meru. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. He worked with her. He worked with yeah. her. Yeah. 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 And, he, and he works with Stan. So. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. So he oh, so Yeah. So you're, yeah. You're right. You're all in the same place there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and Lou Kaufman. I was reading an essay. Yeah. It's fascinating because he this guy who had yeah. he was in World War II. He was in um, post traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. and had the, a, a flash, and he 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 like the Boolean um, mm -hmm. all the the connectives in the Boolean um, algebra. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, he came up with this new way of doing logic. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Luke Hoffman read him, yeah. and and it seems like uh, there's a lot of reason. This is, it was a kind of a spontaneous understanding of how logic, math, and language. Yeah, right. There's a, something underneath all of those disciplines that yeah. unify those disciplines. Yes, yes. And, and this is what Hoffman is is looking for. Yeah, he is I, as well. Hoffman and, and I, any mathematician will tell you. No formal logic was is not no formal logic is possible without a fundamental distinction. You have to be able to make it once you make a distinction, you can develop a logic. But without that distinction, you can't. And this is also, I think, what Bates is telling us. So what, uh, you know, so that, that's, that's all on that same. That's all on that same that same wavelength. But uh, to come back to what uh, Marco had said. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure at some time you probably read Flatland. If you hadn't, I would highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And it's good. It's worth reading again after you've heard a little bit of this stuff or looked at a tenant lecture, because if, um, if we were, how do you, and this is you know, the question, how do you communicate with the Flatland? You're sitting up there looking into 2D. How do you, how do you tell them I'm here? You can't tell them look up. You have to figure out some other way of communicating to that creature that there's another dimension or, a, let's say, another reality that they could relate to. And I, and I think, in, in some ways, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence, of course, but I think in some ways, and this is my own personal uh, feeling at the moment, um, that, you know, in, in the other thread that, that came up today, we were talking about, you know, being and, you know, is it, 
is it traumatically motivated or whatnot, but just, just the mere fact being that being is at all is pretty hard for me to wrap my head around. It's, it's rather unfathomable. And what, one of the things I feel resonating from, from what Tenen is telling us is here is a consciousness. We'll call it that because he also refers to the work that he's doing as a science of consciousness. And, and he emphasizes the word science and he emphasizes the word consciousness. But if there were, in fact, this consciousness that wanted to make itself aware to us, how would it do it? Take, just taking that flatland model. What, how do you go about communicating to a three-dimensional creature, let us say, a fourth or fifth dimension? And it seems to me that in some, some odd way, this is parallel to that. We, we have, because it's not just, and this is the thing I like, it's not just the, the Bible. I think we'll, we will find this in more places. I have another friend who had, um, had a paraphysical experience, and he talks about sacred languages because there's more than one sacred language around the, the, the globe. But all of them seem to have in common that, and this is another thing that Tenen is finding in this parallel research, but not in this main focus, is that they're telling us the same thing. This is a way for, we'll call it, another dimensional being to make itself known to us. Now, what that other dimensional being is, I don't know. It, within our religious tradition, we call it God, if you're religious, it, or the, the cosmic, or Gaia, if you're, if you're more... Um, you know, inclined in, in that direction. You know, we can call it a lot of things. And this is and the, and the part I really find fascinating is I was reading the article that he wrote about the Emerald Tablet where he goes through and explained this because I've gone through the Emerald Tablet a thousand times before. And of course, it made as much sense to me as uh, any other gibberish I've ever read. And then all of a sudden, it starts making sense to me when I'm looking at it in terms of this geometrical metaphor that he's provided me as an anchor point for that. And I see how these relationships where we're actually, we're all using different words and we're using different, but we're talking about the same thing. And this same thing that we're talking about takes off every time I see the same thing from somewhere else. This is also, an, I'll put it in Gabesarian terms, an a perspectival thing. I see the same thing from another view and I, and I realize it's the same thing. And the moment I do that, I, I feel a whole lot better and a whole let curmudgeony about life in general. Because there, there seems to be a more that is worth looking for. And it, it's the more that I'm interested in, whatever that might be. That, that's why I'm personally kind of trying to deal with this. So for me, in answer to your question, you know, so what's it good for? Well, it could be, it may not be, but it could be. This is, you know, working hypothesis kind of thing that, that, Something, something a lot smarter than me is trying to say hello. <laughs> 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 and I'm not always uh, smart enough to realize, bink, bink, okay, we're doing that. And, and this is why, for me personally, I find this whole idea of being able to gesture or dance, not that I'm a good dancer, I'm you know, not at all, but when I, I see people doing Tai Chi, for example, I California used to, you know, drive down the street, and they were out in the parks. There were the masses of them. And they're all out there in the morning, and they're doing their Tai Chi. And I'm looking at these things, and I'm going, they're, they're doing this. They're doing the same thing. They're making these same gestures. There's a, there's a very interesting article he writes about. Have you ever seen the Philippine wine dance where the waiter kind of dances around, and he, he turns the, the glass of wine around or a flame without spilling it or putting the flame out? And that whole motion is actually the, it's called the direct, uh, direct string trick. But it defines the one half spin of the photon. <laughs> that, that, if you wanted a picture of it, what you watch this guy doing, you go, oh, that's what he's doing. And it's, it's singularly asymmetric. And you're going, oh, okay. Because I'm always going, so what the hell is one half spin? You know, Young talks about that all the time. I must have read this this thing from from Tenen a dozen times. 
And yesterday I'm reading, I'm going, oh, I, oh, okay. I, I kind of get what that, what that means. He, and he's telling us that. And then the, what some of the other things that fall out of this, this is just from some of the reading inside, because uh, Young says, you know, the, 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 the two Tauruses, the photon, it's us, it's the universe. Okay. And he goes to, you know, we're all that. That's why we should, we should recognize like is like. And so, where was I going with this? Derailed my own train of thought. How good am I at that? Oh, well, um, go ahead. Somebody was oh. saying hello. <laughs> well, so, and what, what would you say back? <laughs> Did you say interbeing? No, I didn't say interbeing. Oh, okay. Should I have said interbeing? <laughs> no, that's fine. If you didn't. But, um, somebody says hello. I was thinking of Spencer Brown, and he talks about making a distinction. So just make a yeah. distinction. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he does. Yeah, make because a mark. Make a mark. In the end, it all comes down to you have to be able to make a distinction, even in the Tree of Life Kabbalah. The very first lesson of the very first spheres is the one at the bottom of the tree. It's the you are here and the map in the mall. You know, you're at the bottom of the tree, and the idea is to get to the top. The very first lesson that you have to learn is to discern. Well, let, let me, I just want to add something, and maybe, uh, Marco, I'm responding to a post as well. Okay, so Spencer Brown says, make a mark. Mm -hmm. You make a mark, then you have an, one side and, and the other side of the mark. Then, you cr then from one side, you cross over, and then from that side, you cross back. So you've returned to a marked space. Now talking about trauma and transcendence. And Julie talking about Wally, uh, the man she was helping uh, who had some awful disease and the visions that he had. Um, and the woman who had the near death experience who was given this vision during the near, near death experience of all these mathematical, geometrical, topological figures, and then her hanging out with Lou Kaufman, trying to sort this out, and him confirming that she's made these discoveries. And the other gentleman that Lou Kaufman was working with, who had, uh, who, you know, he was traumatized in the battlefield, and he had a vision. And uh, he's working out all these, uh, this Boolean algebra does, does a, a much more elaborate job than Boolean did. And Kaufman is making this comment. He's looking at Brown. He's looking at this woman that I'm just starting to study and looking at um, this other gentleman. And, they had, and trauma. It seems like for us to have a glimpse beyond the flat land, we have to be hit over the head really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and knocked down, go unconscious. So that, you know, this interbeing can can give us some info that then we can wake up if we're lucky with enough memory of it. And then we can sort of uh, hopefully find a code that we can then share. And this is a real big problem. Um, and I think you mentioned um, the, the, the Merkava, right? Merkava. And the wheel with the wheels. Yeah. And, uh, these visionary prophets, how they're very different from the Buddhists. Uh, you know, with their interest in, nir in nirvana and emptiness and emptiness is form, etc. Um, the, the prophets in Israel came up with visions mm -hmm. and it freaked them out because they were given a responsibility. Now go back to the people and share it. <laughs> you know, make sense of it. Yeah. And that was a, a huge responsibility. Um, and the, there was in Ezekiel, it's very interesting because a lot of the UFO people, they look at yeah. 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 Feel those visions <laughs> and um, looking at, you know, obviously these were probably uh, persons who were either having very altered states of consciousness or had taken some sort of drug or, you know, they were in, you know, extraterrestrials were visiting them from another planet or something in a, in a spaceship. So I'm just fascinated by vision and trauma mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. the relationship between um, I'm not necessarily saying that it has to be traumatic. Visions mm. have to be traumatic, but it's, it's, I don't think it's, um, I think it's just a very interesting research question. Well, I, I think you're right, John. And not to interrupt you, you wanted to say something, Margaret, but I know what I wanted to say. Thanks, um, it isn't, 
it doesn't have to be traumatic, but it is often traumatic when you realize what it's about. You know, it can be a very gentle thing, but then all of a sudden you realize, holy shit, my whole world has just changed. And what do I do with it? What do I, yeah, not, what do I do now? You know, well, thank you for waking me up, you know. <laughs> and that can be traumatic. That can, it can be traumatic if we choose to interpret it as such. Uh, that's, that's the thing. But what I wanted to say, uh, Marco, just to come back, with the photon, you know, the, the double slit experiment where the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the resonance patterns don't actually match what the trajectory of the protons should be. And it seems like the protons are choosing which slits to go through. Young says, given our general acceptance that silence is, accent, is assent, that we agree, the first volitional choice that is ever made is no. You have to negate, and this, this, and this is interesting because we've been talking a lot about no thing and nothings and what, but you have to negate. You just don't go with the flow, throw, throw photon out of the laser or wherever it is, I'm gonna do my thing. It says, no, I'm going the other way. So the most fundamental choice that a human being, a self-aware being can make is to say no, consciously no. This is a thing that it's so hard for most of us parents to teach our children to do because we're the first ones they're going to say it to. <laughs> but that's the thing that we have to do is to get them to say no mm -hmm. so that they just don't go along with everything else. And, and that's it's right. Right. I mean, it's right here in Genesis. I mean, it's... In the, in the third story in Genesis <laughs> where the tree comes up and the snake shows up and the fruit comes up, you know, that's where we learn to not do what we were told. Mm. Uh, th there's some other things I think we can go into here. I, I don't, I, I should get going. I have, okay, well, I should well, I say know. no. <laughs> <It's a continuous laughs> because we've gone over. I know. Uh, we've got yeah, well, way over. over is relative. I, I, I I'm, I'm aware of things I need to do to okay. this that, uh, um, relate to my responsibilities as a as an adult <laughs> and so uh i want to make well, sure really back from vacation now huh? transition to, to those um but something about this uh, being and trauma uh transcendence and trauma what i'd written in the um in the forum was this just formulation that popped into mm -hmm. my head when i was reading heidegger in my 20s <laughs> Which is what is, his question was: What is what is being? What is the meaning of being? And uh, as I was in my various you know, postmodern classes, and we were doing our comparative literature thing, and uh, I was actually trying to think about it, you know. And you, it, you can approach that from a formal side, but then you get that when we talk about being, it's not just an abstract. It's not just an abstraction. That's why Heidegger talked about the history of being. When you think about the history of being, well, then you have to think about history. Like, we are the beings who are open to being. We question being. You know, we cannot be. We can recognize non-being. We can recognize the no. This is part of what Sloterdijk is saying now in this, in this chapter that we're, we're going into in, in Globes, is that through those negations, through that spherological, he calls it, collapse, we have to repair, we grow the sphere. And so then you see that these books are at the heart of these civilizations uh, that you know, are, in his way of phrasing it, spherological expansions, you know, world historical spherological expansions. And, uh, and the, the, the violence that's at the heart of that, that, gets in, that is encoded you know, in the texts, and then becomes expressed in history. So by the time we come to, to, by the time we wake up to being, we've already been, we've already fallen, if you will. <laughs> we've already, uh, we're already responding in some way to a negation. And the sense I was trying to get to, or maybe what I'm trying to unpack, just by equating those two. And then I think transcendence is something that happens. Uh, as part of this awakening too, but that, that 
in the actuality of our human experience, that has only happened through this tragic process of humans coming into being through their historical struggle and through their historical violence uh, against each other. And so, uh, and against ourselves, this, this is, and, and if we look at the code, is there a way to kind of reverse engineer that, I would ask, mm -hmm. such that we could get kind of get better code. <laughs> if, mm -hmm. That's, mm -hmm. I think, part of what like Sam Harris and these, he's like, well, just throw all that code away yeah. and start with some new code. I mean, he even says in his talk with uh, Eric Weinstein, um, who I, I think is an interest, very interesting fellow, uh, also a practice, uh, a, 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 also a, a, a Jew with theological, mathematical, mm. physical, like, you know, real knowledge. Or maybe not real knowledge, but certainly, you know, training and, and uh, mm -hmm. insight is... Uh, well, is there something in the code that 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 um, can be expressed differently? Because if the, if it's not a top-down DNA, but can be some code could be run, some code could you know be not executed. It could be interpreted differently. Uh, if if we have a more sophisticated understanding of how code is actually expressed, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's not, it doesn't have to be in the kind of master-slave type of dynamic. Mm -hmm. Relation, mm -hmm. which is also a computer, fun, you know, yes. computer uh, architectural yes. function. Um, what, what's the code that we actually, like, what's the code that we need mm -hmm. right now is, I guess, what I would ask, mm -hmm. uh, such that we can transcend the trauma of being. Right. Uh, yes. I, and I, I, I think one, one of the things is, and, and you do get this from other places, John will bear me out on this. People who have had near-death experiences or any other kind of... Or out-of-body experiences. Or out-of-body experiences. I have an out-of-body tend, tend to be very violence-negating when they come back or when they come to the other side or when they, they, they come to this realization. And, and I, I personally think that one of the things the code is telling me is... I'm going to say this in my words. I know, I know you fell and you did that thing, but it's not necessary. And I think once you experience the code, this is why I find the dancing, the gesturing so important. Once you experience the code, you realize what the code means or what the code's about. And I don't think it's what we, we think it means, like just sitting here talking about it. I think you know, I, I've only had one quasi-mystical experience in my life. But I do know one thing. It changed my life forever. And since that point, I have been probably to the point of self-abuse nonviolent. It's something I can't, even, I can't even get myself up for it anymore. It, it's, it's really hard to explain. Because the most senseless thing in the world that you can do is be violent in any way, shape, or form. For me, that, that's something I just brought back from my little, it was a little one too. This wasn't even a big one. I have, I have great admiration for people that like go through the veil and come back and, and tell us about it kind of thing. But I do believe, at least that's my working hypothesis, I'll repeat that part, that once you recognize the code once you experience the code. And this is why I'm also a big fan of experience. You have to experience it. But once you experience the code, then you understand the code, not before. But you have to experience it first. And when you do, you ain't so, going to be the same person that you were before. So you're using the code. I'm, well, but that, I'm doesn't mean you, that doesn't mean you have an understanding of the code. No, no. I mean, I can speak I'm, tons of... English sentences that have that's correct. Spoken before, that's correct. That, that's why the experience, of at all. No. experience. It's a whole different kind of understanding. You know, it, I think it has to, uh, because of this beingness, it has to be experiential up until now. For me, it's been mostly intellectual, uh, partially emotional, but it hasn't been experiential in the, in the, let's say the alateness, the, the vital experiential form, the magical form of experience that Gapeso talks about, for example. I think it has to go all the way, all through all of those le levels of experience. That's why I love Gapes' model. It's not right. just not 
it's just not lived experience. It's, you know, it's not just, you know. And that's why. Erfahrung, it's the Erlebnis auch. You know? And I, I, this is why the Sam Harris and the Metzinger, these guys read me the wrong way because they are not transparent to their own functioning at the mental level. No. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm quoting like Robert Bella, who wrote The Axial Age, and mm -hmm. I can't remember this other theorist, but, um, oh, this guy, Wolfson. He says, <laughs> you, have, you have myth, mm -hmm. you have um, mythopoetic, and then you have uh, poetic theory, and then you have theory. Mm -hmm. Theory never emerges without myth, mythopoetic, mm -hmm and poetic theory, and then pure theory. And these guys are working with theory. Mm. And they're just saying, we can just drop all that other stuff. Right. If they did, the whole thing would come crashing right. down. You don't have to orally read before, you, before you sign when we read. It's, it, yeah. that, that's the same thing. And it's always in those borderlands, those liminal zones, that the best uh, theor theories emerge. So that's why my I find them very problematic. They're very smart people. Yeah. They're very accomplished people, but they're not transparent mm -hmm. to uh, they're in this deficient mental grid. Yeah. And they think that's all there is. Just like Frankel was saying, it's like an eleven year old who's learned trigonometry and mm -hmm. said there's it's all trigonometry. That's all there is is trigonometry, which is really cute from an eleven year old. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is what these AI guys are trying to put over on us. And I think it's going to – but I am a, a fan of AI. If mm -hmm. you get some people together, like this Weinstein guy, who are transparent mm -hmm. to all these – to the, the mythic, the magical, the mythic, mm -hmm. the mythopoetic, then whole, they would be – A whole different be, discussion. Then the, then, the, then the kind of AI that they would be producing would be a very different kind of AI. Mm -hmm. And I think that's – uh, then we would have something like what we see on Star Trek, you know, <clears throat> people could, and I think that the kind of technology that would emerge um, would be a very different kind of technology than the technology that is starting to emerge out of this very narrow focus. So anyway, that's my two cents. Yeah. But, but just to, to reinforce one small point that you made, I don't think you need any of that technology. That's the thing I like about what, what Tenen at least lays out there. Mm -hmm. You don't need anything more than you and your own hands. That's right. You, know, you, you got every, every tool you possibly need, you've got right in front of you. And a few friends. <laughs> well, that helps. <laughs> you need other people who have the hat. You get back in when you go. The deep yeah, end. right. You can't do this on your own. You have to have other people it's around. It's nice to have other people around. Yeah, my first and animals too. was on my own. Believe me. And I birds know. and everything. We need the whole thing. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> I think. I think. Uh, I think that was wonderful. Thank you. Eddie. I think you have to be responsible now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to looking at this again. All right. Uh, I'll get it up as soon as I can. And, right. And we'll see you on Thursday, right? Indeed. Great. I'll put up, I'll put up the presentation. You put up the, uh, the reference there, John. I'm, uh, I sure will. I'll look her up. All right. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your patience, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Bye-bye. All right. Bye now.